everybody, and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm your host, Tom Vassell, and we have a show for you with fantastic contributors, all with some board gaming goodness in it. Last week on my Monday q and I announced Dice Tower East, which is a continuation of sorts of Dice Tower Con with differences. I'll be taking more questions about that in today's uh, Q&A, so if you want to come back uh, later on today, I'll be talking about that. And, of course, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, you can always email me at tom at dicetower.com about the convention if you want to volunteer and be uh, you know, involved in it in some sort of fashion, you can email us and let us know that too. Uh, it's a constantly evolving thing, so we're trying to make it as good as we possibly can, but that is still a year in the future. Right now we're concentrating on some closer upcoming events. We have our Gen Con, uh, is coming up, the big giant Gen Con show. Our Gen Con live show is there. Consider signing up and coming out to that. We'll be there. The Brothers Murph will be there. Uh, it's going to be a fun time, hopefully, for everyone involved. And we'll also have a booth there. We'll talk more about Gen Con as the you know next week probably we'll be doing anticipated games for Gen Con and such. But it's it's on the horizon. Uh, then the Dice Tower Retreat is not too far away. Uh, I'm actually going to be closing registration in a couple weeks for it because we need to get this on the road. It's a really small convention, maybe 150 200 people at most. Um, and if you want to come and play games in an environment where that's just what we're doing, we're playing games. Uh, we have our Every week you see me adding games to the Dice Tower Library. Those games are the games that you will be able to play there. So uh, then you can find out more information about that at DiceTowerRetreat.com. Then Table Toppers. Uh, Berkey has made fantastic uh, gaming tables without legs. Well, why, why would you want that? Well, these actually attach and fit on top of an ordinary table. So you can put them on top, you know, snap it together, and it's portable. It's easy to store, and they look fantastic. Well, you can win one of these or win a certificate to get one of these, and you just have to go out to their webpage, Table Toppers, and there's a contest there with Eric Summer and all kinds of sort of things. Check it out and enter the contest there. All right, with that being said, let's jump to things I found on the Internet this week. As always, if you have something that you would like me to highlight or look here, email me at tom at dicetower.com and I'll take a look at it and it might show up on the show. First of all, I have Meeple PhD. This is a really interesting channel where she takes science and then talks about a board game that matches it. I'm always a big fan of, you know, reality and board games and I like that combination. So this is a neat YouTube channel. PC Gamers, they have announced the best board games of all time. Are you going to agree? Of course not. Are you going to probably click the link and look at them anyway? Sure, because that's what best board game lists do. Someone made a Lego Hero Quest. <laughs> I like Hero Quest, uh, an old game. It hasn't aged really well, and I like to see a redone version of it at some point. But either way, if you want to make it out of Lego or see it made out of Lego, check that. Now, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, a comic review of Paris. So what this is, is it's a, it's a comic strip review. I don't think I've ever seen this before. So an artist went through and he, they drew panel by panel a review of the game Paris. That's a really neat concept. It also seems like it's an immense amount of work, but I found it unique and original and fresh. So check that out. Game Night from Board Game Geek. They did a overview of the games that are nominated for the Spiel des Jahres and Kenner Spiel des Jahres. Very balanced, thoughtful, where they all talk about all the different games that are involved there. So you can see that. Frank West, the, Desire of Isle, the designer of Isle of Cats. This is a pretty hot game on Kickstarter right now. Tetris Cats, kind of, sort of. Um, did an AMA, Ask Me Anything, on Reddit. Eric Twice wrote an article on how to play board games faster. I'm a bit biased in this. I'm kind of like, hey, read this article. <laughs> I don't know. I, I found it interesting, right? Uh, because people, we do like to take our time playing games. So this is an interesting idea. You're like, I, I, I don't want to play games faster. Maybe this article will help you. Then I found a YouTube video. This is from January, so it's kind of older. But uh, just how war became a game. You know, it does seem like war is a theme in a lot of games. How did that happen? Well, this video talks some about it. All righty, well, that's what I found on the internet this week. Let's keep moving. It's your turn. I guess I'm ready. I'm Alan, welcome to We Game Together. We don't have a box. I don't have one. I Do you don't. have one? Nope, because we're talking about conventions. Conventions. We went to our first convention about two and a half 
two and a half years into our board oh. game career. <laughs> We've maybe gamed for about three to four years or sure. so now. No idea. Took us a little while to go to our first convention, which I don't think is really unusual. No. But we want to basically <laughs> encourage people to pick up a convention somewhere, whether it's a regional convention, a nation, national convention, local convention. Yeah. The local big, ones, small, if medium. You're, if you're, like, freaked about crowds, which I totally understand that, um, and it is you're just strangers and right. whatever, I, t- I highly recommend, like, a local convention because they are smaller, and we've never had issues with finding people to play with. We just kind of walk up, and I, like, put yeah. my face, and I'm like, hi. Like, and you want like, to play something? Can you guys play? Uh, we hang out at, like, the uh, game library a lot, and if you see a lot of, if you <laughs> see somebody that's kind of solo <laughs> looking around, you're yeah. like, do you want to play hey. a game, sir? Hey, you. <laughs> so, be, meeting yeah. new people, playing new games, even if you're playing the same games, that's great, obviously. Yeah. Start with something you know, get comfortable with what you're doing. Yeah. Comfortable is the way to go. Mm-hmm. There's some lo- there's usually some Facebook groups and things for your convention. Maybe sure. try to meet somebody beforehand and meet up at the convention and go from there. Good idea. That's our kid. Real Screaming quick, his head we're off. going to Gen Con. Gen Con. Be there meet or us. be not there. You don't have to. You I know, would if you prefer don't want if you to. were there though. It's cool. And then please meet us because be. I like talking to. We want to talk to as many people as we can. That's a problem. We want to play as many games as we can. We have little We Game Together buttons. Yes. If you really want one, it's you this can have one for on a free. Low, low price of free. <laughs> free we'll give one. If you don't want one, I won't be offended too I will. much. I will, but yeah, I'll be a little free. Bit. Free dollars and free cents. All right, guys. We'll see you at Gen Con. <laughs> You'll see us over here in the pictures. We'll see you. This is Roy Candy, and this is Printed Pieces. We're talking about 3D printing and what it can bring to the board gaming hobby. This week I want to talk about a game that I have 3D printed stuff for to the max. So I am talking about Wiz War. Wiz War is one of my favorite games of all time, and I thought it would be really cool because it's you're going through a dungeon trying to collect these treasures. It'd be really cool if there were dungeon walls for the game. So I took some walls that I was using for Journeys to Middle Earth, and I ended up like shrinking some of them so there were smaller as well and I printed out a ton of these to put all over the board so and it's been really cool to um, paint these things up and try to make them look cool so I was like well next what I think I need I need to get some of the treasure chests so the wizards aren't just taking around little treasure chest tokens I can actually have 3d representations of that and on Thingiverse you can literally just type in whatever you want and I found like several different treasure chests of course of varying sizes and the cool thing is that in Cura where you print these things out you can like scale the size of whatever image it is and whatever um, STL file is. So I made the treasure chest all the same size, got them, got them spray primed and painted up. So I had cool treasure chests in the game as well. And then of course I needed the portals that go on the sides because in this game wizards can go through portals and get to the other side of the board so that way you can jump on people. I took this to Dice Tower ton and if I played it with you it was a ton of fun and I really I feel like this is now going to be in my rotation of like games that I take to things to like show off the cool 3D components and play with a lot of people. People. So it's really cool how the thematic immersion can like explode in these games when you make them just pop off the board with 3D printing. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do and if you're a little bit creative, even though people don't have sets for specific games, you can end up melding stuff together to make it look really cool for a board game. Well thanks so much for joining me on Printed Pieces. Tell me in the comments down below your 3D printing experience or if you're interested in getting a 3D printer. So and also what kind of 3D printer content would you like to see as well? Thanks so much for joining me and I'll see you on the next one. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, in light of our somewhat not top five last week, if you haven't heard, we did a top five at uh, Dice Tower Con, but the audio there was not fantastic and I just pulled it because I wasn't happy. We're going to redo that list at some point in the future for you all Um, but this week we're going to be doing our top 10 games based on IPs, on movies on books, on video games, things like that. Um, It used to be a really hard list to put together because it was hard to find games for it. Now it's going to be a hard list to put together 
because there are so many good games that fit on this list. I'll also be doing various reviews as we go throughout the week. I'll be taking a look at the new um, roll and build game called Era from Matt Leacock, the big giant box for Space Alert, and so various other games for reviews from me, of course, this is Sam and Z. The Dice Tower podcast is going up this week. This time we're talking about the top 10 games that start with the letter F, because F is for fun. Um, and of course, lots of other great podcasts you can find on the Dice Tower network. So uh, we got a live play through at the end of the week. Uh, Atlantis Rising. So this new cooperative, well, it's a new version of an older cooperative game that Z and Sam love. Um, so we'll be taking a look at that. So come back for that. And of course, we got live board game breakfast. And we're going to be doing a Dice Tower dive this week, taking a look at a company. And in particular this week, uh, Fantasy Flight Games will be our Dice Tower dive. So all that, testing Tuesday, lots of fun stuff. But let's keep moving on with this show. Hi, we're Board Game Opinions. I'm Jonathan. Speed. Amy. Mark. And this is our Speed Quiz, where contestants are attempting to guess as many games as they can in a particular category. And in fact, this week, our category is Expansion. So I found the top 25 expansions as rated on Board Game Geek. And they have to name, not the name of the expansion, that'd be a bit hard, but the name of the base game that the expansion comes from, but we're ignoring duplicates. So if a base game has lots of expansions, you only can count the base game once, as it were. Uh, and as always, you get two points if it's a game or an expansion I've not played, or one point if it's one that I have. And we're going to start with Mark. Off you go. Twilight Imperium in 3rd Edition. Yes. Dominion. Yes. Uh, Dark Souls board game. Uh, no. Bastard Galactica. Uh, yes. Carcassonne. Uh, yes. Catan? Uh, no. Uh, Agricola? Yes. Russian Railroads? No. Time Stories? No. Ooh. <laughs> I'll open up the floor. Uh, Concordia? No, that was just Too many bones? Uh, no. X-Wing? No. And, um, Sulk in the Mine Calendar? No. Uh, they're all Size. common games. Yes. Oh. I think popular games. Um, the, the, the Gloomhaven. Uh, Does, no. Azul Stained Glasses of Sintra, is that a no? Descent. No. Second uh, edition. No. Uh, then Appear Assault. No. Oh. Colt Express. Nope. Nearly out of time. Tick to yes. right. <laughs> uh, tick to right is one. Oh, oh, yeah. time. <laughs> oh, silly. All right, give us a second to toss up the scores and we'll see how they did. All right, I've added up the scores. Uh, Steve got three, Amy got one, and Mark got two. So Steve is our winner this week. Uh, other games you could have had were Seven Wonders, Arkham Horror, Dixit, Eclipse, King of Tokyo, Kingsburg, Mage Knight, Pandemic, Race for the Galaxy, and Roll for the Galaxy. There were quite a lot that they could have got there. Did you get any that they missed? Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Hey folks, welcome back to another Accessorize segment here on Board Game Breakfast. And today we're going to be taking a look at the Coyotes Board Game Shield. Now you probably have a lot of games in your collection that use some kind of hidden information where you have to keep stuff behind uh, a shield from prying eyes. And the uh, creator, Darren, sent us uh, some samples of his Board Game Shield that he created and kickstarted. Uh, and... Um, so uh, the reason he wanted to do it is because he was tired of his board game shields flipping over, you know, during gameplay, revealing everything that he had behind there and, and thus, you know, uh, doing away with the suspension, right? So uh, he was led to create something for himself and the Coyotes board game shield is what he's come up with. So let's get down to the table and give you a little bit of a closer look. We'll come back and talk about it a little bit later. And so here you have the uh, Coyotes board game shield. Uh, that is the way it comes. And so this is a, a cloth type material. It's rigid and, and so forth. But you can basically put it together pretty simply. Uh, this is going to come together like this. And then you're going to come down like here. And uh, these guys will be pushed in here like that. And then the same thing will happen over here. And now you have your board game shield ready to go. Uh, now, as you can see, there's lots of room inside this thing. And it also has these little flaps here that will help, uh, you know, kind of, you know, people don't cheat, I get it, but hey, prying eyes, right? So uh, you have these little flaps here that will also help you protect uh, what you have in your, uh, behind your shield as well. So uh, these are pretty neat. 
They go together really simply. They're not, you know, difficult to put together or anything like that. Uh, it's literally just four snaps and you're ready to go uh, just like that. So, and then you can spread it apart as, as, as much as you'd like. But they do come in eight different colors, if I remember correctly, from the Kickstarter page uh, and the web page that I'm going to be showing you here in a few minutes. Uh, so there's that. Uh, the Kickstarter did fund uh, successfully, so there's that as well. And then you can also, I believe, go purchase them on his website too. Uh, so let me go ahead and get all that information to you. I have to say that I don't play a whole lot of games where this is necessary, but I can see why this would be pretty useful because uh, if you look on the Kickstarter page, uh, which uh, I'll go ahead and show you here, uh, then you'll can see, you can see where there's just a lot of tests that he put these things through. He, he put a oscillating fan up on one of the videos to show all these different game shields that come in the box in the base set. Uh, they were just being blown over by the oscillating fan, but these guys were standing strong. Uh, you know, during gameplay where, you know, you bring your hand back from grabbing something on the board and then you knock it over accidentally and it just wouldn't happen with these things. So, uh, you know, for me specifically, I don't see, you know, I don't have a need for this, but Maybe you do. So go ahead and go check them out. This is his website, Coyote Designs. Uh, they also make board game tables too, so you can check those out. Uh, but they also have a board game accessories link there on their homepage. Go check it out and see what it's like. But hey, that is the Coyote uh, Board Game Shield from Coyote Designs. Thanks for joining us. Let's get back to the rest of your breakfast. If you're looking for a really good game of about 45 minutes that you can play repeatedly and enjoy every single bit of it, then watch this Rhino Says Yes, because today I'm talking about the Quacks of Quedlingburg. The Quacks of Quedlingburg is basically a bag building game where players are charlatans and quacks, each buying ingredients from the Quedlingburg Bazaar and making their own secret potion. They randomly draw ingredients from their bag, one at a time, and add it to their pot. You can add pumpkins, spiders, crow skulls, mushrooms, ghosts' breath, African death's head hawk moths, cherry bombs and so on. But a pinch too much of the cherry bombs can spoil your whole mixture and make your pot explode. So basically players draw chips simultaneously and they place them on their pots and after each chip drawn you have to decide whether you want to stop or push your luck further. The next spot from the last chip placed in a round shows you the points you earn and the coins you can spend to buy new ingredients. If your pot exploded, then you can get only one of the two, either points or coins. There's special effects that each of the ingredients has according to the recipe books you're using, and some of them also give you points and other things at the end of the round. There's also a precious flask, which you can use to discard the last cherry bomb placed. There's fortune teller effects at the beginning of each round, and at the end of the ninth round, the game ends and the player with the most points wins. I had such a great time playing this game. The theme on its own puts you in a good mood and together with the building of the ingredients combinations and the random and risky draw of the chips one by one gives you lots of excitement. Even when you're being unlucky as to have your pot explode too soon, you still want to play this game again and again. I would say it's sort of like a bit addictive probably because of the variable reward schedule of the push your luck mechanic that gets your dopamine flowing. And you're like, my pot is going to explode, but I really want just one more chip. There's a good catch up mechanism with rat tails that give you a head start if you're behind on the track. And the game offers great replayability as well as there's many different recipe books you can use. And also there's the Herb Witches expansion, which is adding some new elements. So Rhino says a big yes to Quacks of Quedlingburg. It's definitely lots of fun. So what's going into the Dice Tower Library this week? Well, Airship City. Now, I didn't give this one a very high review, but I think a lot of people are going to want to try it out, and other people may like it, even though I thought it was a little slow. Waters of Nereus, I think it's a super fun game. Uh, Lantern's Dice, laminated it, as I do with all my roll and rights. Meow, meow, meow. I don't know how often this one will be played in Dice Tower Library, but it's a pretty cool social deduction game. 
Battles of Legends. Come on, why would I not put this in? And of course, with the Robin Hood and Bigfoot expansion. Uh, then, of course, Lockup. Oh my goodness, this game is super fun. Can't wait to see this one. The new version of Conspiracy, the Solomon's Gambit. And then Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. Uh, the base game is in this box. And then all the expansions are in this one. So I already had it in the library, but we've added everything for it. So this is all of it. But we separated out just the base game in the one box and the expansion to the other, even if the base game is in an expansion box. But whatever. That's what we added to the library this week. Where's party game? How many times do I need to play it to know if I like it? Just one. This one's really easy. I'm talking about this game coming up. Hi Stella from Impul University. I heard about just one. I was not too keen in playing this at first, putting the game to the test by playing it with our group of board game friends who are heavy strategy gamers, turns out everyone enjoys it. I think this is one of the games where you got to try it first to really enjoy it. This is a cooperative game. Game is played over 13 cards where there's scoring system, but we usually don't play with the scoring system or stick to just um, 13 cards. We usually keep going on and on and on because we usually have so much fun. So. The game goes, one person is the active player in each round. Choose one word out of the five available in the randomly selected card. Active players don't know what the word is, but the rest of the players know. Then without communicating to each other, all non-active players each write secretly on their own erasable easel, a word of clue that for the active player need to guess. Then the active player closes her or his eyes. Then the non-active player compare the clue word to each other and any doubling up will not be used for the next stage. Then the next stage, the active player look at the leftover clue and try to guess the word. This is a lot of fun. May work best with your partner or friends that you know quite well. This way you could use clues for the things that only both of you know. Lessen the chance of the clue is doubling up with other non-active players. We really love playing this game. In small part, it has the mind card game feel to it, where you're kind of trying to communicate non-verbally with your friends perhaps, trying to write different clues from them. So thanks for watching, see you next time! Hi, I'm Jordan, this is Second Chance Shelf. I'm still looking back at past Spiel des Jahres winners and nominees. Today I wanted to look at Top Secret Spies, which won back in 1986. Uh, it's by Wolfgang Kramer. It's had a bunch of different names over the years. Um, it's also commonly known as Heimlich and Company. Um, it's also a roll and move game. I know, calm down, let's see what's inside the box. Players take the role of spies doing what spies do best, walking in circles to score points. In the game, each player takes a secret identity that matches one of the colored pawns. On your turn, you roll the dice, and you can move one or more pawns equal to that number of spaces. For instance, I could move one pawn up to six spaces, or I could move two pawns, three spaces each. You do not need to move your own pawn. When one or more pawns finishes on the same space as the safe, then all, players score the, uh, all colors score the number of points printed on the board. Play continues until somebody scores at least 41 points on their turn. So that's Top Secret Spies. Uh, does it hold up after 30 years? Yeah, I think it does. Um, it feels similar to games like Camel Up or Longshot where all the players are controlling all the pieces on the board. Um, but instead of trying to cross the finish line, you're trying to score more points in this game. So it feels a little ahead of its time. It still definitely holds up against those games. Um, so that's a little quick look at Top Secret Spies, or Heimlich and Company, as I believe it's currently called. Um, with that, I'm Jordan. Happy breakfast. One of the people I most respect in my life is my father. Uh, now, my father and I have, in some aspects, the same sense of humor. In other aspects, very different sense of humor. Uh, my dad definitely had a dad humor, per se, but he definitely is someone who liked to joke. And I distinctly remember when I was a child one time hearing him talking to someone on the phone. He called someone up on the phone and he apologized to a person for joking with that person but accidentally offending them with his joke. And when he was done, I was kind of like, Dad, it, it seems like, you know, it was pretty obvious that you were joking around. This person 
you know, I, I didn't say too sensitive. Maybe I wasn't young enough to kind of grasp these things, but that was kind of my thing. And he said, listen, you know, uh, joking around is fun, but sometimes you can hurt people's feelings with jokes. And I was like, oh, I guess, you know, whatever. I'm not, I'll make friends who aren't so, so, you know, easily offended by this sort of thing. Have I made such phone calls slash emails in my life? Yes, I have. I'm someone who likes to joke around. I'm someone who likes to, when I'm at a game table, crack jokes and stuff. I'm very, uh, I, I try to be, I guess, self-deprecating in games, make fun of myself, but it's fun to make fun of other people and getting to that mode. This can lead to problems occasionally. So there's a few times. If I'm playing with a good friend of mine, we might go back and forth at each other and somebody else might come see that and they might think that we actually do not like each other. Or they'll say, wow, what you said there was incredibly hurtful to that person. But because we're such good friends, that sort of thing doesn't really bother us. I remember when my wife first met me and my family when we were playing a board game and, we, and she said, do you guys even like each other? I'm like, oh yeah, sure. We love each other, but we're certainly giving each other grief over the board game. But that's one thing I learned is that when you do this humor back and forth, people who don't know you can misinterpret that. That certainly happens sometimes in our top 10 lists. We're always joking around and insulting each other and going back and forth. And sometimes someone will stumble on our top 10 list and say, wow, you guys are really mean to each other. I'm like, oh. No, well, just kind of how we are. And it's uh, even more noticeable if someone different comes on the top 10 list. Um, I, I did a top 10 list one time with Stephen Bonacore and Rodney Smith, and I got feedback there because I did the same thing, but people weren't used to seeing those kind of interactions with those folks. So again, it kind of came off mean on that. So that's one thing, and that's something in the back of my head. Am I going to stop joking with my friends? No, but I do want to make it clear maybe sometimes it needs to be said at the table that, hey, I'm just kidding here, you know, back and forth. The other thing is joking with people that you don't know. Now, I'm kind of a jokester. You know, I like to say funny things. I think that that helps, you know, get through things. And it, it can. It works in many situations. But joking can often sometimes make you feel like a jerk. So, for example, I read on uh, just recently I went to the UK Games Expo. And someone said, we met Tom, and he was a bit of a jerk. And I thought, well, I didn't mean to be a jerk. I, and I still don't know what exactly happened there. But... I certainly don't intend to give that impression off, but I, I, like, at, sometimes I try something different. Like at the UK Games Expo, several people came up and said, can I get a picture with you? And I was like, no. Ah, just kidding. We'll do the picture. I thought that was funny because their initial reaction was like, what? And then I was just kidding. But you know what? Maybe that, maybe that didn't go over well with them. Like I said, I, I, I like to be self-deprecating -dep to myself in a sense. And when I'm at different areas, at my church or with groups of people, I always say, fair game. Go after Tom, and you'll see in all my shows that certainly happens. And it doesn't really bother me. That just, you know, some people, it's easier to make fun of them than not. Usually. But I distinctly remember one time I was in a situation where someone made a joke about something with me, doesn't matter what it is, and I was like, what? And I was really annoyed. It was a joke, but it really offended me at that point in time. Now, you can say you should get over it and stuff, but it just did. So I went and talked to that person. I said, you know what, um, everything's funny with me. But that particular thing, that particular part of my life, was very, was just, it's very, I'm very sensitive about it for these reasons. And they said, they apologize and everything. And I said, you know what, it's not a big deal. I just want to let you know that. And I think that communication back and forth helps. You know, like if someone's joking with you and it offends you, it's useful to tell them and say, hey, I don't really like this. Maybe people are trash talking, say, I don't really like this trash talk towards me. That's fine, but also as the, you know, that's, that's a rarity for me on that end, it's usually the other way around. I need to be sensitive towards that. So I like to joke around. When I meet people at cons, uh, you know, a thousand people come up to you and talk to you after, you know, the 30th person, you try to say something different, right? You say, and you know, I can't keep saying, how's the con going? What's your favorite game? You know, so I try to say funny and unusual things and that can come off jerky sometimes. Being funny is sometimes only funny to the person being funny. So that happens in the game group too, right? Being funny might offend someone else. So I encourage you, if, if something does offend you, usually go to that person. It's a lot easier than publicly posting it in your meetup group or whatever, oh, this person's a jerk. Usually talk to someone. I know it's harder for people who are non-confrontational. Maybe an email can help too. And you say, you know what? This kind of bothered me a bit. And usually, hopefully, the joking person, when they get an email like that, will go, oh, oh, you know what? I'm sorry and respond, well, if they don't, then they really are a jerk, I guess. Uh, and, and then for people like me, we need to realize that sometimes that when we're joking with folks and we say, oh, 
oh, you know what? I thought it was all funny and games, and they did not. And so this is something that I've learned very early on in life. I learned again when I met my in-laws and different things that jokes don't always work. And it's not something that I'm perfect at for sure because I continue to see it online where Tom was a jerk here and I'm thinking, oh man, I want people to like me. I'm trying to be as nice to everyone as I possibly can. But I do know that my joking can get me in trouble. So if my jokes offend you, please email me, tom at dicetower.com and I will attempt to do better in the future. Um, and I know at this point in time that some people are going to start typing comments below and they're like, people just need to be less sensitive. And no, that's not what I'm trying to say in this at all. I'm not trying to say people need to be less sensitive. I'm also not saying that we should never joke around and have fun because I really think that's good and it helps out of the game table and I think it makes a great gaming environment. But I think we need to be careful that my jokes about whatever may be funny to me, but not funny to everyone at the table, but it helps if they let me know that. And, you know, if you something someone says to you is bothersome, it's usually best to address it to some degree so that the other person knows. Otherwise, you're just going to sit there and get more and more angry with that person. <sighs> Funny is fun, but not always. Let's keep moving. Hi, folks. My name is Andy, and welcome to Portable Gaming, the show about games which are fun to play in pubs and cafes. So I want to talk to you today about the fantastic set collection game known as Herbaceous. In Herbaceous, you and your opponents are rival gardeners trying to build the best possible pots of herbs and from your own private and public gardens. You do this by planting herbs in your turn. You'll draw a card, decide where you want that to go. Do you want that in your private garden, which only you can use, or the public garden, which everybody can use, and put it there. So I'll take this one, put it in my private garden, I'll immediately draw another card and place it in the public garden. Then, on my next turn, I have the option of potentially potting these things. And I'm aiming for different combinations, or unique cards, different matched pairs, uh, as many cards the same as possible. I come to pot those, I can take them mixed from my private and public garden. And that's where the tactical elements come in, because you're constantly trying to worry, are the cards that you need in the centre of the table going to still be there when it's your turn? Have you put a card out there that you know you actually needed because you had to put it there blind? Or have your opponents put that there? And you're constantly pushing your luck to see if you can hold out and hope no one takes those cards that you desperately need to try and get them together to score the most points. Because the more cards you manage to pot correctly, the more points you'll win. This game is brilliant. It shouldn't be as good as it is for simply drawing cards, placing cards, and then occasionally collecting them. But it is so tense, it's so psychological, there's so much kind of gambling elements there as you and your opponents are all playing this rather sedate game of drawing and placing and drawing and looking and yet desperately waiting for that right card to come out so you can score, pot in your special glass jar and make a lot of points. It's a fantastic game, it's a gorgeous game. Beth Sobel's artwork is beautiful, the design is tight. In fact, after this, any game I've seen now with the guys on this box, I'm picking up that game because I know it's going to be great. Uh, it fits nicely on a table, or I will point out it can be pretty big, uh, so you've got to be very very disciplined or be very, very wary at higher player counts. But I definitely recommend it. That is sebaceous. Anyway, folks, thanks very much. I've been Andy, and it's your round. Greetings and welcome to the Megan people. I am Thomas Grogan. How you doing? Now, I am not a mental health professional. I'm often intrigued uh, by, in the board game community, that... I see on social media and Twitter and stuff like that, that uh, a lot of people uh, in the board game community either suffer from uh, social anxiety uh, to, to the point where they almost have panic attacks thinking about going to a con. Myself, uh, I'm, I'm a very much an introvert. I know, I, I'm intrigued by uh, a hobby that is so heavily social based about social interactions. Uh, face to face, uh, getting together with friends, getting together with strangers and playing a game uh, can be filled so much with, with people that are introverts or uh, have, have social anxiety or something like that. And I often wonder why that is. Is, is it, and again, I'm not a mental health professional, so I, I don't, I'm just thinking off the cuff here. Uh, but it is, is board, is there something about the board game hobby that appeals to us or is it something that uh, we know that we need to do to get over our introvertism or, or uh, social anxiety uh, is to, you know, in a sense, face our fears and interact socially with people. So 
Anyway, thanks for watching. If you want to find out more about the Mega Meeple, just go to the website. Uh, blah, 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 yada, yada. Um, yeah, on my, uh, my YouTube channel, I'm going over my top uh, 50 games of all time, at least according to me. So uh, go, to, go to the website, uh, social media link. All the links are there. Uh, so that's about it. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much for watching, folks. I know we don't say this very often, but we do appreciate all of you who are watching. I'm thankful for each viewer. I know that things can, you know, I, I saw some thoughts from people like, well, I wish they had streamed more live stuff at Dice Tower Con because of the viewers. And, and that is something I would have liked to have done more of, but the costs were just prohibitive. Those costs definitely affected both uh, the live streaming and the audio of the recorded shows there. And I want to share that stuff with the world. Now, when I'm at a con, my first priority is to the people at the con. I can't stream stuff to the world at the detriment of the people who are at the convention. I want the convention to be as good as it possibly can. But we are looking into the future and saying, how can we take this con experience and make it fun for people and package it and send it all over the place for you? So we're going to keep working on that in the future. There's just some very, like, streaming at hotels is just, the costs are unbelievably high. But we're not too far away from being able to use our own devices to just stream through them. So when that happens, I think there will be a big breakthrough and you'll see a lot more streaming as time goes by. Uh, and we will try to record our stuff in the future and put it up. But either way, there's a lot of content coming your way this week. I hope you really enjoy it. Um, and if you don't, let us know and we'll try to constantly be improving. I'm excited about a lot of games and reviewing this week. It's going to be a fun time. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.